Hello, welcome back once more. Today we're going to go into chapter four, where we're going to analyze uh, profitability of a firm. So first, let's uh, take a look at um, some common denominations. So unit of measure, this is important. When we are comparing different companies or even the same company across time, it is important to standardize our measure rather than using the absolute values. So here are some common ways to standardize our measure. One is to convert the values into ratios. Um, these are particularly useful when we are comparing with an industry benchmark or competitors have very different size. Um, also for the same company over time, if the company has been growing or shrinking, as long as the denomination is changes over time, you want uh, for the comparison to be meaningful, ratios are a lot better. Um, so these ratios are useful not just for investors, but for uh, management as well. Another way to standardize is to convert ratio uh, to convert the uh, absolute dollar value into a per share value. Uh, the basic way to do this, you take the total sales or total net income divided by the number of shares outstanding. Per share values are particularly useful for investors because investors typically do not own the entire company, they own shares of the company. So this tells an investor what their shares are uh, associated with either revenue or income. Uh, another very useful uh, tool is to look at the percentage, percentage change over time. Uh, just a quick reminder, to compute a percentage change over time, you, we take the new value divided by o, the old value minus one, and this becomes a decimal, and you can convert that into a percentage change. Percentage change is useful both for managers and also for investors. So now that we have um, the unit of measure, so there are three very common ones, ratios, uh, per shares, and also percentage change uh, for a time comparison. Next, we're going to take a look at what do we mean by profitability? Most of the time when we think about profit, we think about net income or more specifically net income available for common shareholders. So if you think about the uh, converting this into the unit, uh, oftentimes um, we talk about earnings per share, EPS, and that's just net income divided by number of shares outstanding. Uh, for ratio, the most common ratio, or one of the ratios that uh, are looked at by almost everybody is ROE or return on equity. But there are other definitions as well, and we're going to dig into that uh, in this class. Uh, so in addition to the bottom line, which is net income, we may also want to look at the operation aspect. So this will include um, gross profit. So this, just, so this is just sales minus cost of goods sold. Um, and then also operating income. So this measures the um, income from the regular and recurring operation of the firm. Um, other terms that you may have heard of, EBIT, EBIT stands for Earnings Before Interest and Taxes, um, or EBITDA, Earnings Before Interest, Taxes, Depreciation and Amortization, um, or NOPAD, so that is Net Operating Profit After Tax. Um, all these are non-GAAP measures, so which means that they are not required uh, on audited financial statements, which means they may or may not be um, available for all companies. So com some companies voluntarily report uh, EBIT or NOPAD, other companies simply just report revenue and net income. So that is, uh, so be, be mindful that uh, some of these are non Get measures. Another non-GAAP measure that is that may be important is uh, report, reporting by segment. So a company are not required to uh, separate out what individual divisions, um, uh, profit and revenue and costs are like. So all these are non-GAAP uh, non measures, which means they are voluntary. Okay. 
other non-GAAP earnings, uh, so what we are doing here is that we are excluding non-recurring expenses or other non-operating expenses. So the focus in our analysis is for the uh, long-term projection. So anything that's non-recurring or non-operating are not part of the main business of the firm. And then uh, in contrast to that, we have comprehensive income. Uh, which obviously includes everything. This um, is because remember that the principal evaluation is to estimate the long-term earning power or earnings that is sustainable. So the, uh, the comprehensive income may incur elements that are not pertinent or relevant to evaluation. So let's take a quick example um, at a company that um, may choose to report some of these non-GAAP measures and then later on decided not to. The company we're going to take a look at is Oracle. Notice in here that the company changes is reporting format in um, 2018. So in 2017, you notice that the company mesh, uh, reports um, Breakdown is reporting by cloud revenue versus um, on-premise revenue, and then they report a final total. But then in 2018, they combine all this. So they, do, they restructure the way that they report their revenue, and they are combining um, cloud service and license support and cloud license and on-premise license. So they break it down based on hardware, license, and, and software. So some of them you can match out. So this exists um, over across different period. And you can see that licensing basically matches up around $6.1 uh, million, uh, but then the other revenue is being combined. And when a company changes its financial uh, requirement, obviously they will have to re restate that. So when they restate their annual income statement, you'll see that in 2017, that is once again, um, this is what they reported um, under the new format. Now, sometimes the restatement will also change from time to time. So you'll see that the revenue for 2018 is different in the as reported versus the restatement. That's another uh, common um, occurrence that you'll see as we uh, examine financial statements. Okay, now let's take a look, uh, deeper look at per share values. So uh, you probably have done some of this a simple per share value in earlier classes. Uh, today we're gonna actually dive into more realistic, which means slightly complex real life problems. So in a lot of cases, um, in especially in your early classes, we deal with simple capital structure. Uh, simple capital structure means that there's no convertible security, so either convertible debt or convertible preferred stock, and there are no warrants or options. Under such a simple capital structure, then the numerator for to compute per share value is simply the, not, the net income or net income available to common shareholders, and the denominator is the rate of average number of common shares outstanding. If you have a more complex capital structure, a complex capital structure simply means that you have convertible securities and you have warrants, you have options, um, or any one of those, then we have to make the adjustment. So to, first of all, the adjustment to the numerator, so net income, uh, we have to adjust for any impacts of conversion. So for example, you, your company has convertible debt. So what that means is if those debts were converted into common stock, then you no longer have to pay interest on those debts. So net income will have then be adjusted, meaning you add back the after tax, so very important um, since net income is after tax, when you add back the interest that you would save after the conversion, that also has to be after tax interest. Uh, and the denominator is similar. You'll have to include the um, with the average number of common shares outstanding, just like you would in the simple capital structure case, but you have to add in uh, the weighted average of all the shares that could be issued from 
any and all of those uh, convertible securities as well as warrants and options. So, so see this stated in formula form, um, you know, again, the basic earnings per share is net income available common stockholders divided by the number of shares outstanding. If you have diluted EPS, then you have to take the net income available to common stockholders plus any adjustment. So again, interest adjustment, preferred dividend adjustment divided by the number of shares outstanding plus shares that would be issued where these securities were con converted. So let's take a look at an example to see how this works. So we're going to use uh, TJX. So take a pause the video, uh, take a moment to find all the important information. So first of all, uh, we have net income. So net income is $609,699. And then the number of shares outstanding is 488 thousand eight hundred nine so the basic capital basic earnings per share is straight pretty straightforward we take net income divided by the number of shares outstanding so that's approximately dollar twenty five next we're gonna take a look at what happens if we do conversion so we have in, uh, it does have convertible debt so we have to look at what will happen when we when those debt were converted into common stock. So we say that interest expense net of tax savings. So this is already after tax interest expense is four hundred and eighty two dollars. So we have to add this to the net income, and then you know. Um, and that appeared to be the only um, convertible expense for the denominator. He said, if the convertible debt were converted, you will increase shares by 16,905 shares. And then in addition, you also have options and the options will be 600 6,934 shares. So those will have to be added to the, denom uh, the number of shares. So to compute the complex or dilute EPS, we have to, once again, add 4482 to 609,699. And we have to add 16,905 and 6,935 to 488,809. And the diluted EPS in this case is $1.20. Next, we're going to take a look at ratio analysis. A good place to start for ratio analysis is looking at common size financial statements. Um, we can, uh, common size simply means we are converting every single item in the financial statements into a ratio. To do that for the income statement, we divide each item by total revenue. So to compute a co uh, common size income statement, we simply divide every single item in an income statement by total revenue. And to compute the common size balance sheet, all we do is divide every single item by total assets. So uh, that's very simple to do and is a very useful starting place. Once we have the common size financial statements, then we can take the next step, which is drilling down um, to see additional to uh, to compute additional ratios that will give us more information. But just simply computing the common size statements, we can compare uh, all these income statements and balance sheets side by side between companies against industry average, and also over time, and you can start to see patterns and see whether or not there are big changes uh, in particular area within the financial statements. Other ratios that are very common um, include return on assets or ROA. An important characteristic of ROA is that it does not depend on the firm's use of leverage. So, um, and that is useful because uh, particularly for um, 
lower level management who do not have impact on the firm's uh, capital structure decision uh, to evaluate the performance is much more important to understand ROA than the bottom line ROE. Another reason why ROA is important is in the case for an investor in a mergers and acquisition situation. If you're acquiring an entire firm, then chances are you will change the capital structure of the firm. And so once again, ROA will tell you what the uh, profitability of the firm is without taking into effect a leverage. So it measures um, how well the firm uses assets to generate earnings. The basic principle in computing ROA is that you should um, make adjustment as necessary so that the return on asset is not affected by how much the firm is financed by debt versus equity and also the cost of debt or the cost of equity. So ROA is strictly measuring um, the operating profitability of the firm. So ROA is typically defined um, by net income available to common shareholders. So that's the bottom line. And what we want to do is add back um, pre-tax uh, after-tax income, so uh, after-tax interest. So here we take interest expense times one minus the tax rate, that's after-tax interest. So that means um, how much we pay for our liabilities is not affecting um, the return. Uh, we also add back any non-controlling interest that is um, in, in the earnings. So once again, we want to take away or subtract or, or add any effect that is not generated through the um, normal operation. And then we divide that by the average total asset. A concept that is very closely related to ROA is return on invested capital. And the, uh, the idea here is that part of total assets may include cash and other securities that are not actively being used to generate revenue. Um, they are kept for transaction use only. So we do not expect to be able to generate return on them. So a more realistic um, return measure is uh, ROIC, return on invested capital. So what we want to do to compute ROIC is that we have to subtract from total asset um, any excess cash or any non-interest bearing liability. Once again, uh, the idea is that all these um, asset cash and also non-interest bearing liabilities are not invested capital. They are they're there for uh, transaction only to keep the, to, to really, um, it's not expected to, to uh, generate uh, return. Obviously, ROA is a very important measure for profitability. So let's take a deeper look at ROA. So we'll do this quite often. We'll take a, a, um, a ratio or a profitability measure and we'll see, well, what composes of this um, this ratio? So this is a decomposition or disaggregation. For ROA, we can separate into two components. We can separate into a profit margin component and a turnover component. So remember that the numerator is the same in both cases. Uh, the profit margin will change the denominator from total asset to sales. And asset turnover is sales divided by total assets. So of course, we can cancel this and then you get, we get back to ROA. The reason we separate the two is that the profit margin measures the profitability and asset turnover measures the efficiency. So this is the profit margin tells us how profitable it is we are on our sales. So this is partly driven by the competitiveness in the market um, because we can only charge so much um, and also the strategy that the firm chooses, right? If a firm chooses a low cost strategy, we'll expect a 
lower profit margin. But if a firm chooses a low cost strategy, we'll expect more efficient operations. So expect a higher asset turnover and the resulting ROA could be quite high. Uh, on the other hand, we may choose to use a uh, more bespoke or um, unique product uh, branding strategy. Uh, we can, in that in that case, we can expect a higher profit margin. Uh, but you may have um, slower turnover. Right? So, those, um, of course, the best case scenario is when you can have a high profit margin and high asset turnover. But this, again, we can match this to the strategy of a firm and look at this. Does the firm execute? Um, optimally according to the strategy that they have specified. In the next video, we're going to go over a detailed example on computing ROA and its individual components. See you soon.